Welcome to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and joining me today is Delegate Eileen Fillercorn. She represents Virginia's House District 41. Thank you so much for joining me, Eileen. Thank you, Katherine. It's a privilege. Pr S pleasure to be here today. So we met the first time during your special election. That's when I first got introduced to you. Uh, as I recall, there was a lot of snow involved. It was um, February of 2010. It was during Snowmageddon. That's right. And um, I went out door knocking for you, and you prevailed. I don't know how much snow had to do with it, but, <laughs> but there seems to be a pattern of women in special elections and snow in Virginia. But I, I would like for you to share with our viewers a little bit how you came to be in a special election to begin with in February sure, of 2010. Sure. Well, let me start by thanking you mm -hmm. for helping me <laughs> and uh, for all those doors you knocked in the middle of snow again. Um, I think that's right. I think I had always been involved in the community and I had been um, involved you know, prior to having kids just wanting to make a difference and getting involved through organizations and, and when I had my children getting involved through through their schools. So I always wanted to make a difference and be involved but I really you know, had never seen myself as a candidate or as um, an elected official so to speak. And I had been involved in politics as well and um, had done the law school thing and um, I just uh, was working for in many cases other people. Um, affecting change and um, and all of a sudden this opportunity presented itself so I uh, was approached by several folks um, other elected officials and people who had um, leadership of the caucus who had uh, asked me if I would consider running um, they knew I was an activist they knew I was an attorney they knew I was um, active in the community and uh, and that's kind of how it came to be. I remember getting a call one point, uh, probably in, I guess it was in the, in the summer, and uh, folks had approached me and said, well, if, you know, if X, Y, and Z happen and all the stars align, would you consider you know, running? And at the time, Ken Cuccinelli was my senator, and uh, he was running for, uh, for attorney, attorney general. general. That's right. And uh, my senator, at the t actually my delegate at the time was Dave Marsden, and he was, in, he was running for re-election. So again, some of the stars that had to align, it was you know, first, uh, first Dave Marson had to win for re-election, and then Ken Cuccinelli had to win. And um, if that happened, Dave was thinking of running in a special election for the Senate seat. That um, that later, and he'd have had to, to win. win, and he had to win, right? So there was so, so many pieces, so much that had to happen. But you had to be ready when. And all of those things did happen. That's right. To, to make a decision. When the call came, it's like, we need a candidate. Because it's a short window. When, when, when Dave won, then there's a very short window right. when you campaign. So you kind of had to make that decision. Were you going to do it or not do it? I got the phone call, and you know, and you know, Ken won, Dave won, and then Ken won, and then Dave ran in a special and won. And they said, OK, now it, it's your turn. Are you going to do this? And I think at the time, they might have given me maybe 24, 48 hours uh, notice to do it. And I just thought about it quickly, and I thought, you know what, I can do this, and I can, I can make a difference. And, uh, um, and I jumped right in and had a few weeks, you know, uh, camp special election again in the middle of Snowmageddon, as you remember. <laughs> I do. It was, uh, it was challenging to even find the door. You talk about door knocking, and you could barely even find the door down the driveway. And, uh, but it was, uh, it was a great experience. Well, you've had a lot of legislative wins. You're in your fourth session, correct? I was elected in 20, 2010, then re-elected in 2011. That's right. right, so you're in your fourth session. So, you know, there's a period in which freshmen kind of have to pay their dues in the, I don't know if it's that way in every state legislature, but it's certainly that way in ours, is that it's very hard when you're new to get things done. But at this point, you have a lot, you have racked up a lot of legislative wins. Uh, especially this year, we're going to talk about some of those bills. But you know, where where does a lot of the legislation come from that you end up patroning and sponsoring? Well, you know, I find that one of the highlights for me is the ability to work with people, with with citizens, with stakeholders, and um, you know, and I and I've said this often, but I feel like a lot of my legislative legislative ideas have come from individuals in the community. So whether it be you know one-on-one -on -one meetings with constituents, whether when I'm knocking on doors, I have the opportunity to meet with people. Um, speaking at homeowners associations, people come to me with ideas. They come to me to talk about the problems or issues, and and um, so sometimes they actually have a specific idea for a piece of legislation. Other times we're just brainstorming. And for me, it's all about making a difference. 
And I always said that I would continue you know, to run and to do what I'm doing if I felt like I was able to make a difference. And I feel like I really am working, working with people and um, in constituents. And so that's been the majority of my, uh, my experience with legislation that has passed has really come from working with individuals as they share with me their personal experience or problems or you know. And so some, of, so some of the pieces of legislation have been focused on education. They've been focused on what people would say are women's issues, meaning it's something like the birth control, the contraception bill that got passed and signed into law this year right. that uniquely affect just women. That birth That's control right. bill affects women. But you've done things around bullying. You've done things around FLE curriculum in the schools. You've really done things to try to improve the level of education of our children in the school system to better improve their experience in the educational system and to make it safer for them as well. Exactly. I, yeah, I mean, I, I talk about this often, but when I knock on doors, when I meet with constituents and citizens, you know, the, the issues that I hear most about really are public safety, education, and um, you know, and I, and I think you know, transportation to a, you know to a lesser degree, but it's really when constituents come to me with a problem or an issue, it's normally focused around their family. How does it affect them, their lives, their their family members, and um, and that's where the the passion is. And so I have found that working with individuals and working with some of these fabulous stakeholder groups as well um, has really enabled me to move legislation forward. That combined with developing good relationships with folks and working across party lines, which is essential. Well, you is essential because you're in a minority. Exactly. So you are in the House. You've got 35 members out of 100 members, which means that without converting some of those votes if you know because things tend to be very partisan in this day and age without help from the Republicans in the house you really can't get anything done and exactly. you have gotten things done exactly well thank you and I'm very proud of what I have gotten done um, but I think so much of that is the ability to develop relationships it's all about relationships as we've often said and um, developing those um, those ties with people and also the the desire the inclination to compromise and work together and I find that 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 that's key. And without it, obviously, as you said, when you look at the, the numbers, we're not going to have successes. We, it, it, the inability, um, you know, we don't have the ability to pass legislation when you're one of 34. But if you have those relationships, you're willing to compromise and bring people together, working simultaneously with these stakeholders and these individuals to try to educate people, and that includes my colleagues, to see why we need to make this change and you know, and so much of it is negotiation too. The ability to say, okay, um, here's here's a bill, here's an idea that I have, and you know, you go to them one on one, you talk about it. Invariably, they might say, oh, I, I, I'm not supportive of that, or I don't agree. It's like, okay, well, look look at this. What piece of this do you agree? There's got to be one piece of it that we can agree on. Let's move forward. And I find also that multiple years, if you're willing to, you know, to move forward, do a little bit this year, then you can come back next year. It's all baby steps. And I think it's not just for the Virginia legislature, but most legislatures work like that. Small baby steps. Exactly. And so what a lot of people don't understand about the legislative process is, first of all, constituents do often bring something that, a problem that they need solved. The second thing is they need to do issue advocacy, and sometimes that means bringing your parent group, even if it's an all-volunteer or organization, to educate legislators. Then it takes somebody sponsoring the bill who knows how to either patron it or find the appropriate patron, and that's just something you have to live with the fact that sometimes your bill may not have your name on it. Exactly. And sometimes it might take more than one year. You get part of it this year, and I think this is true of your consent bill. Yes. And then you have to forego or you have to compromise in order to get two-thirds of it passed mm -hmm. and then come back the next year and try to get the one-third. That's right. That's exactly right. And, um, you know, well, well said. You just have to be willing to compromise and work together. And there are times when, you know, you expect to get A, B, and C done and you realize there's not, there's not consensus, there's not support for that, so you have a choice. You can get up there and give, you know, give a fabulous speech, which, of course, you know, I'm willing, willing to do. And, you know, but do you just walk away then and say, oh, well, or do you say, I wanted A, B, and C. Can only get A, A and B. I'm going to give that speech, but I'm going to 
you know, strike C for now, but we'll come back next year and see if we so can. So let's talk about the committees that you're on and how being on specific committees, you know, the Democrats are not ever in the majority on the committees, right. so you're always a minority on the committees as well as on the floor. But finding that compromise, wheeling and dealing so that things don't get killed in committee because there's thousands of bills every legislative session and many of them die before they ever That's see right. a floor vote. So what are the committees that you're on? I'm fortunate. I'm on transportation. I'm on commerce and labor and finance and they're you know great committees I'm very fortunate to serve on those committees and uh, but as you said I think so much of it focuses around relationships too and um, so you know while I have the opportunity to try to convince my colleagues that this is a good bill or a good idea I think the key is bringing in those stakeholders as well because obviously whether you're working with an organization or an individual chances are there are other organizations or other individuals in some of my colleagues' districts that care about that issue too and that bill that can also then you know, come in person and actually try to convince those legislators. So starting next session, it looks like a lot more of these committee meetings are going to be broadcast. That's right. Some people, I think Progress Virginia was Facebook living them last session because right, which was new. these votes are not recorded. So it's hard to hold people accountable for killing bills and committees when you don't have a record of how everybody voted. But that seems to be changing. It does. I think there's going to be a lot you know, high, more visibility and transparency, which I think is a good thing. And we did see it this year. This was the first session, and um, you know I, th I think it did you know play a, play a role. I think uh, legislators are more aware that they're being taped or that they're being videotaped, and you know and that what they say and how they vote is going to be public. And I think that's a good thing. So it's accountability. It's so accountability. the vote is the vote. But prior to this, we didn't know how anybody voted. Now we exactly. will know how people vote. So so it makes it for a more uh, educated constituency to say as I questioned Jim LaMunion about voting against the, the additional curriculum to the driver's ed about how young people interface with the police. You know, he voted against that in committee. Well, and he voted against it on the floor. So now people in his district can evaluate why he did that. Right. And there needs to be more of that. Accountability, yeah. And I think there was definitely more of that this year. This is the first, as you mentioned, this is the first time I think that the, uh, the sessions were, were taped. And while we have the opportunity for individuals to come in person um, and observe in the past, as you also know, we, it's such a uh, fast, <laughs> frenetic pace when we're down there. It's, it's, you know, as you know, it's just 40 or 65 days of the year in the session. So we start early and so often the sessions, you know, we can be in committee meetings or subcommittee meetings at certainly by 7, 7.30. 7 yeah. And it, it's hard for people to get down to. So having the opportunity to be able to watch it online and have them taped, again, increasing visibility, transparency is a good thing for all of our you know, citizens. I think so too. And when we come back after the break, I'm going to talk with Eileen about specific bills. And again, this is about educating the constituency. It's not just paying attention when there's an election, as there is this year in 2017, where all 100 delegates, including Eileen, is up for re-election. People need to be pay paying attention all year long and being part of the process. So please join us after this break. Please have a seat. I'll be honest. Your resume is not what I'm used to. I know. Okay, so what would you bring to my company? What do you need? I need a hard worker. Good. I've got two part-time jobs and to help my parents pay the bills. Any problem solving skills? I got through high school without a car, a phone, or a computer. No college degree, though. Not yet, but life's taught me a lot and I'm ready for more. Well, you're not the typical kind of candidate that I hire. But you are exactly what I'm looking for. Your company could be missing out on the candidates it needs most. Learn how to find, cultivate, and train a great pool of untapped talent at gradsoflife.org. Welcome back to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and joining me today is Delegate Eileen Fillercorn of Virginia's 41st House District. 
Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. So I would like to talk specifically about some of the legislation, that, the things that you are so proud of and that some of our viewers may be familiar with but not necessarily know that you are the person who patroned that, shepherded that, and got it passed. And, if, and talk a little bit about the things you, you have coming up that maybe didn't get passed this year. Sure. Uh, there's. Yeah, there's several bills that, I, that I've had passed um, that I'm very proud of, um, both this year and in the past. And um, there, are, there are several that, uh, that did not get passed, but I believe strongly in, and I'll be coming back next year. So I guess one of the bills that I'm most proud of is the ABLE Act. And um, the ABLE Act is, the, um, is a bill that enables parents with kids who have disabilities to save tax-free, um, as we all, as many of us do, in like a 529. And um, that bill, um, I introduced that bill, I believe, two times before it actually passed. And um, you know, it was one of those things, as we described, mentioned earlier, that sometimes it takes multiple years to get to get good legislation. It wasn't passed. Virginia the first state to do that after and Obama at the federal level exactly signed right. off on it. That's exactly accounts. right. And so again, I think that's what made the difference. But again, having the opportunity to work with parents with kids that have um, disabilities like this, and to see uh, to see what it means to them, and to be to hear time and time again, ever since we passed this bill, that this is changing their lives is the reason why I do what I do. And it, um, it's just, uh, it's been fabulous. We had a very, very exciting bill signing for that bill uh, right after it passed um, during the um, Down Syndrome uh, Society's annual meeting, which was incredible. Um, I was able to pass some legislation subsequent of the year following that. Um, and we had the bill signing for that in the, uh, during the halftime show of the Special Olympics. And again, uh, working with people with disabilities is definitely um, you know, a passion of mine and um, having the opportunity to really see how it affects these, uh, these parents and these kids' lives. Well, has it's, it's people-centered policy. In other words, exactly. it's not just ideology. You actually meet the parents, you meet the kids, you understand people share with you the impact that it's That's had right. on their lives. You know what's interesting about that bill too is that it was really a fairness equity issue. What was shocking is that those of us that had kids without disabilities could save tax-free in an account for our children's education in the future, like in a 529, but if you had a child who had a disability, you couldn't do so. And they were the ones invariably that, that need the assistance. So we had, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, the ability to work with parents and um, stakeholder groups come and testify to kind of explain the, you know, why there was an, it was an equity issue, why this was about fairness. Um, it was eye-opening for a lot of my colleagues. So it wasn't as if this was something that, that failed because people didn't think it was a good idea. They needed to be educated on issue, it. Issue education. Exactly. And, and it takes, so many, sometimes it takes years. And it takes people who are motivated. And, right. I, and ordinary people, you don't need, you know, don't need special skills to contact your legislator in person, by email, on the phone, and say, I need a few minutes of your time to explain why this bill is necessary or why we need better public policy. Exactly, yeah, and I think, uh, I think you're right. I think a lot of our constituents don't realize that we're as accessible and available as we are. And uh, I mean, I hold office hours once a month um, around the district, but I'm available for one-on-one -on -one meetings, phone calls with anybody, anytime. Absolutely, so you've taken on some issues with the family life education curriculum too over the years. I have, yeah. Two, a couple years ago, I introduced a bill uh, focused around age-appropriate, evidence-based curricula, um, focused around healthy relationships. What constitutes a healthy relationship? Sexual harassment, sexual assault, domestic violence. And um, as part of that bill, I had um, a consent component to it. And that was two years. I introduced that bill two years ago. Again, working with some fabulous uh, constituents uh, and stakeholders and individuals from around the Commonwealth. And as I mentioned earlier, the, there was some interest in the bill, but it looked like they were, they were not ready quite yet to pass the consent piece of that. And uh, so I had a choice. Do I pull the whole bill and, uh, you know, or do I move forward? I thought, no, this is a good bill. We need to continue to educate and inform our youth. And so, we pa so I went ahead, passed the bill, um, had the bill signing, was great, but they had stripped out the consent piece. And um, obviously working with constituents in, um, you know, all around the, the Commonwealth, I felt like this was something worth fighting for. And in this day and age, we really needed to talk about consent and not just what is consent, but the law and the meaning of consent. And so I introduced the bill this year, um, you know, tacked it right back onto the bill that I passed last year about healthy relationships, and uh, we passed the bill. 
That's fantastic. And of course, I think some of this stems from campus sexual violence. That's right. You know, we several years ago, there was a very high profile case at UVA. But, but what came out of that is the fact that it was far more prevalent than people knew about. It was vastly underreported. Mm -hmm. Lots of women came forward to say that they had experienced that kind of sexual violence on campus and had never said anything. Right. So talk a little bit about, you know, you've done a lot of work on that. I have, and um, I had worked several years and passed um, a, a couple different pieces of legislation focused around campus sexual assault. And really, you're right, that, that was my focus, you know, initially. And I think my first bill that I worked on was probably, um, it might have been the first year I got there, maybe it was tw 2011 or, or 2012. And, um, and as you mentioned too, there are times when we work on bills and they get passed, maybe with a different name, and right, by that, somebody that's else. okay, <laughs> that is fine, as long as, as long as we're moving things forward and making a difference. And so I focused so long on that, it was kind of a light bulb went off and I suddenly realized, rather than focusing on punishment, as, as I was and had been legislatively as it related to camp, campus sexual assault. Now, why don't we focus on prevention? And that's when I came up with the whole, let's talk about age-appropriate evidence-based you know, curricula focused around healthy relationships and then consent. And so we actually have the bill signing coming up for, for consent with the governor um, on the 9th. So, so this is something, there's an evolution to legislation too. Definitely. You know, and, and, and so there's an arc. It doesn't happen immediately. I think people get discouraged. You know, I right. worked on autism insurance re reform, and right. that was just 11 years, I think, in the making. And so it's not, earned income tax credit, which we keep trying to expand in Virginia, got shot down in committee. But um, I remember Kim Plum saying that it took 10 years to get That's it right. at all. Yeah, don't give up, right? Just, wait, just right. keep, keep at don't it. It's worth up. fighting for. So what are the things that you're not going to give up on? <laughs> well, there's several. Um, <laughs> several. I had a bill uh, for the last two years uh, focused around providing a sales tax exemption for the purchase of biometric gun safes. And I was excited to introduce this bill because I really felt like I could see the, the support and the stakeholder group really being very broad. Um, I, you know, I was thinking that the gun safety folks and you know, the average parent were going to be supportive of that because if somebody breaks it into your right, house. Right, they can't steal it, the gun, the, that, kids, can't the kids can't find it. Right. Exactly. And on the other hand, um, you know, folks that, that are very concerned about having quick access to their, to their weapon would, would support that too because again, it's, you're talking about a sales tax exemption for biometric gun safe, so it's quick, easy access. Um, unfortunately, that was not successful, um, and I've introduced that twice. But it had we had a lot of different, um, uh, I guess, str strange bedfellows of support of stakeholders there, and um, I think we saw a lot of support for that concept. And so I'm hope hopeful after you know maybe maybe next year will be the the key year. Maybe it'll be it'll take you know three technology years, takes leaps forward too. It's like a lot of us unlock unlock our smartphones with our thumbprint, that's right? right? Like and we did not do that. And we I'm didn't sure. used yeah. to do that. So the whole That's idea right. of a biometric gun safe is not a, a far leap from what a lot of us do every day with our thumbprint. That's right. So perhaps we just need to get a little deeper into the psyche of people to understand what it is. Right. That's right. Absolutely. And sometimes, as, as you alluded to earlier, sometimes it's the, uh, it's the patron. So there, there might be somebody else that can introduce the same bill. And um, while it may not have our name and, or might have a different bill number, that's okay as long as the concept moves forward and becomes law. Some of the things you do are very specific. Um, and, and I know that one of the, the studies that you got passed was uh, around something called PANDAS, which is not very well known. It, I don't know how many people it affects, but one of your constituents came to you and said, this is something that just needs more resources, it needs more research, and I'm asking you to, to please do this. And that is something that was in a win column for you this year. Absolutely, that was very interesting. And again, kind of a combination of uh, my work with people with disabilities. But I, uh, yeah, somebody from Northern Virginia who I've known for a long time, actually through the Autism Speaks uh, world and some of the work that I had done specifically with autism, had um, shared with me uh, that her son had, um, was diagnosed with PANS and PANDAS. I had never heard of it. And then I received a phone call probably this past, this I think was this past summer, uh, from another individual who had received, received my name as somebody who might be interested in, in taking this on. And uh, PANS and PANDAS is, um, it's in, it, it's 
fascinating, it's debilitating, and it's been very, very challenging for parents to diagnose. Um, many many um, kids who have exhibited certain mental health issues, certain anxiety and, and stress have been actually diagnosed, misdiagnosed um, uh, with autism and have found out later that actually what they have is PANS and PANDAS. And so these, these parents came to me and they said, you know, we really need to do more research. There's just a problem. It, it, it costs thousands and thousands of doctors. Sometimes, you know, you need to see 10 or 12 doctors over a course of several years just to be diagnosed. And uh, so we introduced a bill and uh, talk about education. I remember talking to the parents who came to me and I said, look, this is going to take a lot of your time and a lot of your energy and effort. We need to educate my colleagues just like you needed to educate me. I was hardly an expert, nor am I now on that topic. But um, they said, we're up for the challenge. And they brought their kids. And they were in, you know, in the uh, General Assembly building every single day, every s meeting with every single member of the, the committees that this bill was going to go before. And they did a remarkable job. And we were able to really educate my colleagues to, to explain to them that there was a need here to form an advisory council. And in the end, the bill passed. And um, you know, we had a lot of support. The speaker was a, was a real champion of it at all as well of this bill and um, you know and we're really really excited that this is going to make the, again make a difference in the lives of so many parents and talking to these parents seeing how hard it's been and how challenging it's been for for their kids they feel like there's hope for the first time well and I'm very hopeful too so talk about some of the other things that you know again some of the bills that you've taken on disproportionately seem to directly affect women and children and because our legislature has such a low percentage of women, I think it's 17 or 19 percent, which is well below the national yes, average. Is. You know, when it comes to things like paid leave or things like regulated child care, for instance, these things have not gotten a lot of attention in our legislature. And so we are at the bottom of a lot of lists or at the top of a lot of lists we don't want to be on. Right. So talk a little bit about your strategy for taking on some of these things. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. I think we all introduce legislation that means something to us or that either that we have a personal you know, connection to or that we hear about in our communities. And I think obviously you're, you're right. When there's few, fewer women that are there advocating, I mean, fewer women are going to focus on, you know, more, more women focus on these issues than men. And, um, you know, and I think the other thing too that I, I feel like with, with women, you also have a certain element of collaborators, people right. willing to collaborate and work together to get problem things solving. done. Like problem there's solving. A, solving. There's a problem exactly. here and we need to solve it. Exactly. And yeah, working on, you know, child care has been, you know, passion of the, mine. The for, one for bill years. that was there ended up being vetoed by the governor. Yeah. Very yeah. sad. Yeah, that was, I mean, I was very actively working in support of that bill initially and working with uh, Senator Hanger. Um, and uh, there was, uh, yeah, some amendments that were made that made it um, pretty, you know, dangerous, horrific bill, actually. Uh, but you know what? We're not going to give up hope. And um, I, you know, I, I think that within time we can, we'll, we'll come back next year and work on that. Well, and I'm going to look forward to, to looking at your list of bills, which people can probably find on your website, I'm imagining, once you have a list of everything you're going to introduce next year. Right. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank if you, you want to find out more about Delegate Eileen Fillercorn and her legislative agenda coming up in 2018. You can go to delegatefillercorn.com. And thank you for joining us today because this is the just the information that you need to know.